الْعَلَمَ فَسَوْفَ نُعَذِّبُهُ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَى رَبِّهِ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَى رَبِّهِ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ عَذَابًا نُكْرًا وَأَمَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُ جَزَاءً الْحُسْنَى وسنقول له من أمرنا يسرا ثم أتبع سببا حتى إذا بلغ نطلع الشمس وجدها تقوم على قوم لم نجعل لهم من دونها سترا كذلك وقد أحطنا بما لديه خبرا ثم أتبع سببا حتى إذا بلغ بين السدين وجد من دونهما قوما لا يكادون يفقهون قولا قالوا يا ذا القرنين إن يأجوج ومأجوج مفسدون في الأرض فهل نجعل لك خرجا على أن تجعل بيننا وبينهم سدا قال ما مكني فيه ربي خير فأعينوني بقوة أجعل بينكم وبينهم ردنا آتوني زبر الحديد حتى إذا ساوى بين الصدفين قال انفخوا حتى إذا جعله نارا قال آتوني أفرغ عليه قطرا فما استطاعوا أن يظهروه وما استطاعوا له نقبا قال هذا رحمة من ربي فإذا جاء وعد ربي جعله دكا وكان وعد ربي حقا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيك ما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله we are coming down we are down to the wire we are down to the last few days of Ramadan ولله الحمد uh, hopefully, inshallah, everyone is in the spirit of taking advantage of, you know, what these last, you know, nine days of Ramadan have to offer. Um, so we want to continue with our discussion that we've been having all Ramadan, and that is the book Reflections for the Heart, Exploring the Hearts that are mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah. This is the revised version of the book, Alhamdulillah, finally got it corrected. And uh, anyone that is willing, so the revised version is, you know, yesterday's price is not today's price, okay? So the original price of the book was $25. Uh, I discounted it for the books that um, had the error in it. Some of you purchased it, some of you would rather wait, and that's fine. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, we have the uh, revised version of the book uh, corrected all mistakes all errors are corrected hamd, including uh, some of the errors that I found over some time within the Arabic so alhamdulillah that was uh, that is uh, the book is now available uh, those of you who pre-ordered the book your some of the pre-orders went out to this morning another bulk of the pre-orders will go out tomorrow morning inshallah ta'ala and we should be done with all of the pre-orders by friday morning so most of you who pre-ordered the book especially those of you who ordered from the very beginning your order went out this morning and you should receive uh those of you who live in the philly area you live in delaware you live in south jersey uh the books you you usually get them in one day so you'll probably receive your book tomorrow uh those of you who live in uh, further uh, usually uh, you have to wait a day or two. Priority shipping is usually two days max, all right, unless you're in California. But anywhere up to probably Atlanta, it's about two days, which is why I use pr priority shipping, all right? It's it's $10, but it gets to you in two days. I per per personally don't like to wait. Uh, even when I order things online, I always use the expedited option 
for a few extra dollars because I like to have my stuff when I like it. I don't know. It just That's just me. I don't like sitting around waiting two weeks for something that I ordered. My anxiety, I can't handle that. I like to have it two days after I order it, three days after I order it, and I'm done with it. Uh, I will be in Philadelphia on Friday at the Philadelphia Masjid, Masjid uh, Sister Claire Muhammad. Uh, I will be there Friday for Jumu'ah, inshallah ta'ala. So if you want to wait till Friday to purchase the books, I've already put in another order this morning because these books are going extremely fast. Uh, they're going extremely fast. So um, 400 books are almost gone. Walillah uh, alham, that's a that's a great thing. Um, uh, <laughs> Abdul Latif, you said you're going to delay my Abu's bean pie. No man, bring me my bean pie, man. Stop playing with me. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Uh, so I just put in a, a order. Uh, all of the books that were pre-ordered, they're only getting the revised version. I I did not. I was not going to send out any of the books that had the error in it. The only books that the only people who got the books that have the er, the error in it are people who purchased it from me personally, or they emailed me and asked me. They don't. They didn't mind. They wanted me to ship it, which was only a few people. But the the those who ordered pre ordered the book, I would not send you something that you didn't ask for. You didn't ask for a book that had a mistake in it, so you're not going to get that. All right. So all of the books that were mailed out are the books that are the revised version of the book. I would not send you something. Um, I don't want that on my reputation. All right. How do the sisters know who received the books? Uh, received the free books? Uh, Sister Amina, I mailed your book out eons ago. Uh, e email me, please, so I can give you the tracking number to your order. Your book been mailed out. Been mailed you that. All right, um, today's price is $25. So if you purchase the book today, the book is $25. Okay, so we're moving right along, alhamdulillah. So I will be in Philly on Friday for Jumu'ah. Uh, and I will have the books with me. So if you would like to purchase the book, I'll try to get there a little bit early because I have to be in New Jersey for a lecture um, Friday night. So I won't be here Friday night. Um, so I'm going to be in and out of Philly because I got to hit the highway immediately after Jumu'ah. So I'm going to try to get there early. Uh, Jumu'ah, I believe, is 1.15. So I'll try to get there around 12, 12.30, inshallah ta'ala. I'll, I'll try to get to Philly early for those who would like to get there early and purchase their book. Um, but after Jumu'ah, I'm probably going to be out because I have to jump on the highway and head up to North Jersey, inshallah. I will be at Bunton Masjid JMIC for Friday night lecture, uh, as well as um, I'm thinking to continue my lecture even though I'm there. I, I may decide on that, or I may decide on another topic. I don't know, uh, but yes, I will go live. You have no, you have nothing to worry about. I will go live on Friday night, inshallah. But for those of you in the North Jersey area. I will be uh, at Bunton Masjid in Bunton, New Jersey, JMIC. I will be at JMIC for uh, a night lecture before Salat al-Maghrib. So it will be around 6.30, 6.45, the lecture will start. Uh, I'll post the address. I'll post the, the name of the masjid and the address. Uh, I'll post it on my Instagram page and my Facebook page, inshallah, for those of you in the North Jersey area. All right? Yes. I have some. I have a whole bunch in my trunk. Yes, I do. Yes. All right. So we are uh, we arrived at chapter number 11. And this is Qalbun Marid. And although it is translated in Arabic as the sick heart, we already dealt with the sick heart in the previous chapter. We I titled this one, The Disingenuous Heart. All right. And the reason why I translated disingenuous um, the word marid, which means sick, but I translated it as disingenuous because this is the heart of a hypocrite. And the hypocrite is someone who is disingenuous. A hypocrite is someone who professes something on the external, but on the internal, they harbor or they believe something else. So that is disingenuousness. All right. So that's why I translate it. But it is a form of a sickness of the heart. All right, as we stated, as Ibn Qayyim mentioned in the last lesson, that the sickness of the heart 
is two, there are two types of sicknesses of the heart. There's shahawat and shubuhat. Shahawat, which are your lusts and lowly desires, and shubuhat is what we're going to talk about today, and that is where a person inclines towards doubtful matters, misconceptions, misunderstanding, misinformation, things that have room for interpretation in order for them to follow their desires. All right, they don't want to follow hard and fast rules. They want to follow their desires, so they look for the loophole. They look for the loophole. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you have your English translation of the Quran, turn to surah number 2, ayat 10. Surah number 2, ayat 10. Uh, this is in surah al-Baqarah. And the beauty of the beginning of surah al-Baqarah is that in the first five ayats, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believer. Alif lam mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك To the end of that, those first five ayats, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a description of a believer. Then in the next two ayats, he gives a description of a disbeliever because a disbeliever is very, it's not a, compl it's not a complicated character. Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there are those uh, uh, who disbelieve and he describes them in two ayats. Then the next set of ayats, which are around 12 ayats, the next set of ayats, the next bulk of ayats, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to describe the hypocrite. And if you think about it, he takes more ayats to describe the hypocrite than any other character. Why? Because the hypocrite is a little bit more complex. He starts off by saying, uh, And from amongst mankind are those who say that they believe in Allah in the last day, verbally. They say they believe, and then Allah dismisses that statement by saying, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ They are not believers. So a hypocrite, in essence, is a disbeliever. But it's a special kind of disbeliever. There's not a person who uh, overtly expresses his disbelief and his discontent with God. This is somebody who uh, covertly, inside, they disbelieve in God, but externally, they say, yeah, I'm a believer, I'm with you. All right? Very dangerous character. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضْ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرْضًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in their hearts is a disease. The disease that Allah is talking about here is hypocrisy. The disease of what is called nifaq. Nifaq, which is the Arabic word for hypocrisy. N-I-F-A-Q, nifaq. All right? فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضْ In their hearts is a disease. Was فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضَ And Allah increases their disease. وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ And for them is a painful punishment for the lies they used to forge. This is the heart of the hypocrite. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in another verse in the Qur'an, in surah number 24, ayah 50. Surah 24, ayah 50. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرْضٌ Allah says, is there a disease in their hearts? Meaning the hypocrites. Is there a disease in their hearts? Or are they in doubt? Or do they doubt God? Or are they in fear that Allah and His Messenger will be unjust to them? Rather, they are the ones that are unjust. They are the ones that are unjust. Now, when we think about a disease, we usually associate a disease with an ailment that affects the body. We usually, when we think about a disease, when somebody says a disease, this person has a disease, we usually think about something that affects the body of the individual. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing us here when he uses the word disease, al-mard, afi qulubihim mardun, is in their hearts a disease? He uses the phrase or he uses the term disease in a, in a way where it affects the body, it affects the heart, right? The same way that it affects the body. Disease affects the heart, 
the same way that it affects the body. From a spiritual standpoint, the disease of one's aqidah, the disease of somebody's belief, is one that is spiritually perilous and debilitating. Why? Because it causes a person to live their life in doubt and gravitate towards misconceptions that are fueled by misinformation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَبْتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلِ And as for those in whose hearts there is perversion from the truth, and we'll get to that, that is one of the hearts that we will cover, الْقَلْبُ زَائِغ The heart that deviates, the heart that deviates from the truth. But Allah says, as for those in who, as for he in whose heart there, or those in whose heart there is perversion from the truth, they will follow from the Quran that which is ambiguous, seeking fitna and also seeking to arrive at its meaning arbitrarily. Meaning, they want to arrive at a meaning that is consistent with their desires. So they'll take a verse from the Qur'an that's not totally clear, that's kind of vague, it's kind of ambiguous, right? Because there are verses in the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left unclear. And He left it unclear for two reasons. Either one, He left it unclear because the knowledge of that is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that is to show us our own intellectual weaknesses. Because as human beings, we like to think that we have it all figured out. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us through the Qur'an that scholars, generation after generation after generation have studied the Qur'an extensively, still cannot give you the meaning or the understanding of certain things that are in the Qur'an. For example, the letters, Alif, Lam, Mim. What does that even mean? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start certain surahs with just letters? Some three letters, some five letters, Surah Maryam, five letters. Surah Baqarah, three letters. Surah Ali Imran, three letters. Surah Qaf, one letter. Qaf. Sad. He begins with one letter. What does it mean? Two letters. Taha. مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى إِلَّا تَذْكِرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Why did he start the surah off with two letters? Why this surah with one letter? Why this surah with three letters? Why this surah with five letters? حَامِيم This is from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one knows. Even if someone comes up with something that they, uh, in, a, in a way that they can interpret that, it is from their own interpretation. There is no authority that can give a stamp of approval that that is the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started these surahs off with these ayats. Huruf muqatta'a. This is from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Awasta'atharata min fi ilm al ghaybi min indik. As we say in the dua, O oh Allah, we ask you. Uh, by every name that you have. Allahumma inna nas'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa lak. We ask you by every name that you have. Salam mayta bihi nafsik. That you have named yourself, aw anzaltahu fi kitabik. Or you have revealed in your book, aw a'lamta ahadam min khalqik. Or you have taught someone from your creation, aw istatharata fi ilm al ghaybi min indik. Or you have kept hidden from the knowledge of the unseen that is with you. An taj'al al Quran al Azim al Rabi al Kulubina. وَنُورُ الصُّدُورِنَا That you make the Qur'an, the great Qur'an, the noble Qur'an, نُورُ الصُّدُورِنَا The light of our hearts. رَبِيعُ قُلُوبِنَا The stream, the river of our, of our hearts. This is in the dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And then there are some that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left unclear because they were to be explained in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That is where the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ comes into play. So there are certain verses of the Qur'an that are vague, that are ambiguous, not totally clear, because then we are supposed to turn to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ for further clarification. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ And establish the salah. That is a broad command. No details. No dhuhr, four rak'ah, 
Asr, four raka'ah, you will never find that in the Qur'an. Not one ayah in the Qur'an details to you how many raka'ah each salah is supposed to be. You don't get that from the Qur'an. There's no ayat in the Qur'an that says Salatul Fajr is two raka'ah. No ayat in the Qur'an that says Salatul Jumu'ah is two raka'ah. Not one ayat in the Qur'an. 6,236 ayats, you will not find one ayat that tells you that Salatul Jumu'ah is two raka'ah. The Imam stands up for the khutbah for two, two parts of the khutbah. He stands up the first, and then he sits down in between, and then he stands up, and that counts for two raka'ah. And then the two raka'ah we pray counts for another two raka'ah, that's four. There's no explanation in the Qur'an that gives you that. You have to go to the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. What you will find in the Qur'an are broad instructions. وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ And establish the salah. وَآتُ zakat And pay the zakat. The Prophet Wasallam stood on the minbar in front of his companions. He, is, he performed the salat. And then he turned around to the Sahaba and he said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have just seen me praying. Pray as you have just seen me praying. So there are some things that are left ambiguous and vague in the Quran to show us how weak our intellects are. That no matter how intelligent we think we are, there are still things about this book, even those who have memorized the entire Quran, the entire Mus'haf, from cover to cover. There are things in the Qur'an that they have memorized that they will never know. How is that for the strength of your intellect, the strength of your memory? That you memorize something that you will never have the knowledge of it. You can memorize it all day long. You can regurgitate it when you need it in conversation or when you need it in academic discourses. But you will never know what it means. How about that? How about that for the limitations on the human intellect? SubhanAllah. And then there are things that are vague because we are supposed to get the understanding of it from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But those who have a disease in their hearts, they go after the things that are vague and ambiguous. Why? Because by going after something that's not totally clear, it gives you room to interpret it the way that you want to interpret it, so that you could use it for in, in any way that you want to use it. The Khawarij used the Qur'an as proof to make takfir, to say that many of the Sahaba were kuffar. Think about that. They use ayats from the Qur'an to justify takfir, making the many of the Sahaba kuffar. <laughs> from amongst them Abu Bakr and Umar. The Shia, they use ayahs from the Qur'an to say that Abu Bakr is in the hellfire. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is in the hellfire. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is in the hellfire. They use ayahs from the Qur'an. The Khawarij use ayahs from the Qur'an to say Ali ibn Abi Talib is a kafir. Subhanallah al-Azim. As Shakespeare said that even the devil can use scripture for his own agenda. That's a quote from Shakespeare. Even the devil can quote scripture for his own agenda. So keep in mind, when a person has a disease in their heart, they will always go after what is not totally clear in the Quran to justify following their desires. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْءٍ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ as for those in whose heart is a disease, they follow that which is mutashabihat. Alright, there are ayats that are clear, wadihat, and then there are ayat al-bayinat, al-wadihat, and then there are ayats from the Qur'an that are mutashabihat. Mutashabihat are ayats that are ambiguous, that are not totally clear. Ibtigha al-fitna, seeking to cause fitna, wa bitigha al-ta'wili, and seeking to arrive at its meaning arbitrarily. Imam al-Sa'di, the modern mufassir uh, of our time, who's passed away, but he was actually one of the scholars of one of the shuyukh of Sheikh Uthaymin. Sheikh, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdurrahman ibn Nasr al-Sa'di, he commented on this verse by saying, disbelief, kufr, count them out. Kufr, nifaq, hypocrisy, shek, doubt, and bid'ah, innovation. Four things are all from the diseases associated with shubuhat. 
all from the diseases that are associated with shubuhat. Shubuhat are what? Doubts and misconceptions. From amongst them, there are four major, four major diseases that are associated with shubuhat. That's number one, kufr, disbelief. Number two, hypocrisy, nifaq. Number three, shek, doubt. And number four, bid'a, innovation. All are from the disease of shubuhat, the second type of disease that affects the heart. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. While fornication, zina, indecency, and disobedience are all from the shahwat, the first disease that affects the heart. The hypocrisy that these individuals suffer from is founded upon deception and duplicity. The origin of which is disbelief. The hypocrites of Medina sought to benefit from the incremental advancements and successes of the Muslim community by proclaiming to be believers all the while they never truly believed. They claimed to be believers, but in fact they were disbelievers. They were not believers at all. Subhanallah. And they only came around to benefit from the successes and the advancements of the Muslim community. So when there was a war and the Muslims won and they were triumphant on the battlefield, then you would find that the, disbelief, that the hypocrites, they would come around to take part in the spoils of war, to get a, some of the, the war booty, some of the spoils of war. You, you follow me? They only came around when there was some benefit, some immediate benefit that came to the Muslim community. They were never there when the hard work needed to be done. When they were never there when the Prophet ﷺ, when the Sahaba were building his masjid. They were never there when it was time to fight. As a matter of fact, they would go out on the battle, they would, go, they would leave out with the army, and halfway there, they would turn around and go back. When the Prophet ﷺ and the believers were asleep, they would get up in the middle of the night and they would leave and go back to Medina. They're not fighting. Why? Because they're not in it for that. They're not part of Islam, they're not part of the Muslim community you know, as true believers are. They're not invested. You need something, Shaykh? No, just... Oh, okay. You understand? They're not invested in the Muslim community. They're only around. And I want you guys to pay attention to this because this type of behavior does not, you know, this type of behavior does not disappear. It doesn't disappear. There are hypocrites amongst us today in the Muslim community. They exist. Alive and well, make no mistake about that. It's not for me or for you or anyone else to go and say this person's a hypocrite or that person's a hypocrite. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described, gave us a description of them. There's a whole entire chapter in the Quran called Surah Al-Munafiqun, the chapter of the hypocrites. Surah number 63, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives detailed description about who these people are. Not the people specifically during the time of the Prophet Wasallam, but the characteristics. Because those characteristics, focus on the characteristics, because those characteristics, they never disappear. They reappear time after time after time again. The players change, but the game stays the same. The game of hypocrisy remains the same, but the players, they change. They die off. You know, other people come around. But when you realize the hip, you realize the qualities and characteristics, you're able to spot them and you're able to be on hadar. You're able to be cautious about them in your midst because they are there not to aid and to support and to advance the Muslim community. Make no mistake about that. They are there to dismantle and to disrupt and to destroy the Muslim community. They are not there to aid in the advancement of the Muslim community. They are there to destroy. All right. So the hypocrisy of the, in, the these individuals suffer from is founded upon deception and duplicity. They are deceiving, and then they are duplicitous because they come out with one face, but behind closed doors they have a completely different face. And the Prophet ﷺ said, "La yadkhulu jannah dhu wajhain." The person who has two faces will not enter into paradise. The Sahaba said, and who is the one with two faces? The Prophet ﷺ said, Man yeti ha'ula bi waj wa ha'ula bi waj. Meaning, he meets everybody with the face that they want to see. That is not diplomacy. 
Diplomacy is knowing when to hold them, knowing when to fold them. Knowing when to talk and when not to talk. Knowing when silence is better than speech and knowing when speech is better than silence. That is duplicity. Knowing how to read a room, knowing how to read the energy of the people in front of you. That's, that is diplomacy. Duplicity is that I come to you, 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 you want, you like to joke or whatever, and I come to you and I joke because I know you like it. I know you like to do this, so I come to you with a face. I know that you don't like him, so I come to you and I talk about him in front of you because I want you to make, I want to make you believe that I dislike him just as much as you do because I'm with you. And you dislike him, so I come to you and I talk about him to you because I want you to think that I'm with you in your dislike of him. Even though I could care less. I don't have a dog in the fight. But I want, I want you to believe that I'm, I'm with you on that. That's what it means to be duplicitous. That's what it means to have two faces. This is a person who doesn't have any enemies. Be afraid of a person who doesn't have any enemies. Because a person that doesn't have any enemies, what does that tell you about them? What does that tell you about a person who doesn't have any enemies? Huh? They play all sides of the field. They play all sides of the field. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to meet everybody the way that they, you know, want to be met. Yes. That's exactly what that means. That's exactly what that means. They only come around when they see you winning. When you're struggling and you're building and you're, in, you're you know, you're, 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 you want, you, you know, you're in the thick of it, right? Up to your neck in, 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 in difficulty and challenge, they're nowhere to be found. But the moment you make it to the top and you, you, you achieve some success, oh, they're right there. I was there with you the whole time. Yeah, that's those type of people. The hypocrites of Medina sought to benefit from the incremental advancements and successes of the Muslim community by proclaiming to be believers all the while they never truly believed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرُدْ Allah says, and from amongst mankind are those who say, we believe in Allah on the last day, but they are not believers. They seek to deceive Allah. They think that God doesn't see them in what they're doing. They really think that they're getting over on God. They seek to deceive Allah and his messenger um, and those who believe, but they only deceive themselves while they don't even realize it. Hypocrisy, nifaq, is a disease that starts out very subtly. And it can slowly take hold of the heart while the person doesn't even realize it. As Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he said, Al-Iman, Al-Iman, tabda binuqtat al-bayda. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, listen to this quote. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, the Iman, faith, it starts off as a white dot, small white dot on the heart. And every time one grows in their faith, the white dot grows. It gets bigger until his heart is completely white. And what increases your iman? He said every time the person grows in faith, that white stain, that white dot on the heart grows until the heart is completely covered in white. What causes your faith to grow? Okay. All of those are symptoms. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Ibadah. Okay, that's one. Salat. That's Ibadah. But before you can get to Ibadah, you got to get to what? What causes faith to grow? Awareness. Awareness. Knowledge. Ilm. Yes. You can't have faith without knowledge. The more you learn, the more your awareness you know, grows and the more your faith grows. Because faith and, and, and knowledge go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You can't believe in something that you don't know. 
Our religion is not a religion of blind faith. We don't just believe as we were taught in Christianity, right? Just belief, right? You, you come to, the, you come to the, the pastor, the preacher, and you say to, yourself, you say to him, you say, um, it doesn't really make sense. How is it that Adam ate from the tree, right? Or let's do the Christian version. How is it that Eve was able to persuade Adam when Adam was created first to be the leader of the family? I, I don't understand. How was he to be susceptible to a woman who was on a completely different wavelength when God created her for him? That just doesn't make sense. So early in the, in the game, so early in, you know, in the stage of their development as human beings. That's number one. If God created Adam to be the leader. How is it God can create from his rib, his wife, who would deceive him to eat from the tree? In the Quran, Allah holds them accountable Together, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ أَنْهَكُمَا أَنْتِلْكُمَا الشَّجَرَةَ وَأَقُلْ لَكُمَا إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمَا عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ For those of you who understand the Arabic language, there is what is called a duel in the Arabic language. There is the singular, al-mufrad, there is the jam, there is the plural, and then there is to a man, there is duel, right? Two. And the... The second person, right, when you're talking to someone, first person, you're talking about yourself. Second person, you're talking to the person. Third person is you're talking about yourself or you're talking about somebody that's not there. Second person is the direct al-khitab. You're talking directly to someone. In the second person, pronoun, kuma means you too. You too. So Allah is addressing two people. So in this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the dual, ver, the dual um, pronoun throughout the whole entire verse. He said, Alam anhakuma, did I not prevent you two? Antilkuma shajara, on, did I not prohibit you two from this tree? Wa akullakuma, and I say to both of, and I said to both of you, in the shaitan lakuma, that shaitan is to both of you, I do one moving. Throughout the whole entire verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing both of them equally. Equally. So the, in the Quran, in Islam, in the Islamic tradition, Eve did not deceive Adam. They both were equally deceived by shaitan. That's number one. Number two, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Adam not to eat from this tree, Adam goes and he eats from the tree. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because there was no... There was no uh, need for repentance before this. This was the first act, second act of disobedience, uh, but the first act of disobedience that required Toba. Shaitan was the first act of disobedience, but he never made Toba, never repented. Adam, on the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to teach him how to repent because he didn't know how to repent. Similar to the two sons of Adam, Cain and Abel, when one killed the other, he didn't even know how to bury his brother. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the bird down, a crow down, that dug, dug a hole and buried the crow, buried another bird, showing him, this is how we benefit from nature, right? SubhanAllah, so deep, right? Showing the son of Adam, man, he said, I didn't even know how to bury my own brother until this crow taught me how to bury my own brother. We learn a lot from nature. We learned the process of burying a body in the ground from a bird, burying its own. SubhanAllah, how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to teach us through animals. We learn a lot from nature, right? We have submarines as a result of whales, right? We have planes as a result of birds. We learn a lot from nature, man. SubhanAllah, Allah is so merciful. There's a lot of fighting styles that are based off of animals. There are a lot of fighting styles. Fight, fighting styles, yes. Praying mantis, a lot of... Um, Different art forms, different you know styles of fighting that are based upon animals. Absolutely. We learn a lot from animals. But Adam didn't even know how to make toba until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him how to make toba. And then after Allah taught him how to make toba, Adam makes toba and Allah accepts his toba. So now the thing that is confusing to me is why did God need to send his only begotten son, God forbid, la ilaha illallah, hasha wa kalla, sent his only begotten son to die for the sins of mankind that mankind was never guilty of. 
Where did the sins of mankind come from? They said the sins of mankind came from the first man, Adam, who ate from the tree, disobeyed God. So that means that every child born to Adam is born in sin. Natural born sinners, born in sin. But in Islamic tradition, Adam did not know how to repent. God taught him how to repent. And then after he repented, God accepted his repentance. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَرِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah says, and Adam, Allah taught Adam some words, meaning how to repent. And then Allah accepted those words from him, meaning accepted his repentance. وَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ And turned to him in repentance. إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ He is the oft returning and the most merciful. So if God accepted Adam's repentance, how in the world can we say that all of the children born to Adam after that are born in sin? They're born in his repentance, not born in his disobedience, not born in his sin. We are born in the repentance of Adam. So therefore, it eliminates the whole idea of God needing to send down his only begotten son to die for the sins of mankind because there weren't no sins for mankind because God accepted Adam's repentance. The greatest lie ever told next to the devil doesn't exist. The greatest lie ever told. So many of our parents, grandparents, great great grandparents were deceived by this one lie, man. Subhanallah, man. That God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. And I'm trying to figure out on a, on another note, how is that His only begotten Son? When also in the Bible it says that David, Dawood, was God's only begotten Son. So which begotten Son are we talking about here? These are the contradictions in the Bible. Ask the Christian, which begotten son is the verse referring to? Because there's another verse in the Bible that says that Dawood, that David, was his only begotten son. So which begotten son are we talking about here? SubhanAllah. And then of course it says in the Bible that God is not the father of confusion. <laughs> so then... If the Bible has confusion in it as a result of contradictions, then that means that it's not from God. It's from man. Your own book is telling on you. Your own book is telling on you. If it says God is not the father of confusion, if there is confusion as a result of contradictions in your book, then that means that it's not from God. It's not from God. When you're ready to take your shahada, when you're ready, those of you who are Christian, who are listening, and you're listening with an attentive ear and a, an attentive heart, and you are ready to accept the truth, we're here for you. We are here for you. You're ready to accept the truth that you have been lied to, that Jesus was nothing more than a prophet, a great prophet. You're ready to accept that truth. Don't worry about the, what your preacher going to think about you tomorrow. Don't worry about what your parents and grandparents are going to think about you. Because for most Christians who know the truth, that is the only thing that is the biggest hindrance in your life. You worried about the wrong things. You are too busy worried about what your pastor, your preacher, your grandparents, your great grandparents are going to think about you. No different than the Arabs. No different than the Prophet Wasallam's grandfather, uh, uh, uncle, Abu Talib. When the Prophet Sallallahu presented La ilaha illallah to him, he said he knew that Islam was the truth. He said, but he could not be disloyal to his forefathers. You understand? And he died on shirk. He died on idolatry as a result of his loyalty to his ancestors. He died on idolatry and will spend eternity in hell as a result of his loyalty to his ancestors. Subhanallah, think about that. You worry, if you're worried about what your pastor, your preacher, you're worried about, you know, what your mom or your dad or what your, you know, your siblings are going to think about you. If you become a Muslim, you are worried about the wrong thing. What you should be worried about is burning in hell for eternity after the truth came to you and you rejected it. That is what you should be worried about.
Don't worry about seeing your pastor and you got on a hijab now and your pastor's going to see you with your hijab on. So what? You worried about the wrong stuff, man. Hypocrisy, nifaq, is a disease that starts off very subtle and can slowly but surely take control of the heart while you don't even realize it. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Inna al-Iman yabda'u bi-nukta, bi-nukta al-bayda. That Iman starts off as a white dot on your heart. And then that white dot grows. The more you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more your faith grows. Allah says in the Quran, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ الدَّرَجَاتِ Allah will raise those from amongst you have, who have faith and those of you who have been given knowledge in degrees. And notice Allah mentions faith and knowledge in the same ayat. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot be a strong believer and be ignorant. Impossible. Impossible. Faith is built on knowledge. And then from that knowledge comes faith, and from that faith comes action. That's the circle. Starts off faith, and then that faith increases with knowledge, and from that knowledge goes more faith, and from that faith comes action. That's the way that it goes. Everyone starts off with some you know, Qadr al-Mushtarak, some degree or some level of faith. Every, every human being has that. That's our natural disposition. We were born believing that oh, there's only one God. Every human being was born with this. But it's how you cultivate that, how you nurture that. And so if you're a Muslim and you've been Muslim four, five, six, seven years and you're finding yourself still committing the same sins, still reciting the same surahs, still, you know, frequent in the same places, still engaging in some of the same behaviors that you, you know, engaged in before you became Muslim, you're finding yourself stagnated spiritually. And that is because you are not growing in your knowledge and you're not growing in your knowledge. And that is manifesting in the fact that you are not growing in your faith. If you are tired of being a bare minimum Muslim, a mediocre Muslim, then the only way you can change that narrative is through knowledge. The only way that you can change that narrative is through knowledge. Knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. The more that one of the greatest ways to increase in your faith is to learn about the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Asma wa Sifat. Which is one of the aspects of Tawheed. It's to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rububiyyah. The fact that Allah is your Lord, your Rabb. He nurtured you, He takes care of you, He provides for you, He sustains you, He maintains you, He protects you. The more and more you start to learn about how that manifests in your life, the more and more you start to gravitate towards God. The more and more you start to learn about you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's tawheed, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that deserves worship. That everything and everyone other than God comes second. God comes first. He's the first, there's nothing before him. And he is the last, none comes after him. He is a He is a He is the parent and there's none above him. And he is of the unseen and there is nothing besides him. He said, however, hypocrisy, lacking a nifaq, hypocrisy, tabda'u bi nuktatil sawda. But hypocrisy starts off in the heart as a black dot. And the more the black dot grows until his heart, the black dot, the more the black dot grows until his heart is completely black, covered in black. And I swear by Allah, if you were to open the heart of the believer, you would find it to be white. And if you were to open the heart of the hypocrite, you would find it to be black. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu. And the description of the hypocrites, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that their perception of right and wrong is skewed. So they believe that what they are doing is right, while in fact it is wicked and malicious. They believe that what they're doing is right, but in fact it is wicked and malicious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا 
انما نحن مصلحون على انهم هم المفسدون ولكنهم ولكن لا يشعرون Allah says and when it is said to them meaning to the hypocrites don't create mischief on the earth they say we are only seeking to make things right but they are the ones that are creating mischief while they don't even realize it this is how a person can be steeped in hypocrisy and never even realize it scholars mention that hypocrisy is of two types there are two types of hypocrisy there's the hypocrisy in your aqida the hypocr hypocrisy in your belief nifaq al i'tiqadi there is the hypocrisy in your belief meaning you profess to believe in one thing but deep down inside you you don't believe in that thing you say that you are a believer you believe in god but deep down inside you actually don't believe that's the hypocrisy of your aqida of your belief and then there is the hypocrisy in your actions nifaq al amali the hypocrisy in your actions and this is the type of person who says one thing and then does the opposite so when we as muslims use the word hypocrite and we should never call someone a hypocrite right because we don't know which hypocrisy we are the person that that you say that to or you're a hypocrite you know you, you have to understand that a person if you understand that there's two types of hypocrisy and you say to the person you're a hypocrite i'm trying to figure out well which one are you referring to are you saying i'm a hypocrite in that i don't really believe i'm professing something that i don't really hold to be dear in my heart or are you saying that i say one thing and do another all right so it's very you know that's a very slippery slope and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man qala li akhihi ya kafir faqad ba'a ila ahadihima فإن كان ما قال وإلا فإنه رجع إلي أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said whoever says to his brother or his sister in Islam يا كافر you are a disbeliever or a hypocrite or whatever whoever calls their Muslim brother or sister out of their name I want you guys to listen to this because this there was a time in the Muslim community especially amongst African Americans where this was prevalent rampant in our communities whoever calls his brother a kafir calls your muslim brother a disbeliever then he is either as you say he is or he's not and if he's not as you claim him to be then you are more deserving of that quality than he is you are more deserving of that quality than he is and of course as there's a very famous quote that we never describe somebody so well except by we see in them what we see in ourselves we see it in ourselves you identify quality very quickly because you notice it in your own self yeah That's 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 the that's the million dollar question. How do you know? So sometimes what people do is judge based off of a particular action that a person does. Now keep in mind there are some actions that a Muslim can do that if they do it clear cut unequivocally no questions asked they are a kafir. They are a disbeliever. No, smoking a cigarette does not make you a kafir, brother. Abandoning the salat, yes, that. But that type of disbelief is between you and Allah. I don't have a right to tell you you're not Muslim because you don't pray. Someone, someone called me a kafir early this morning talking about. I, I'm, I, I'm sorry that happened to you. That's a great question. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's more deserving of that quality than you are. Absolutely. And and I'm sorry that you had that experience, man. He should have never he shouldn't have said that. Subhanallah alazim, man. And a brother said that somebody called him a kafir this morning for Salatul Fajr. Hmm. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, man. So um, the two types of hypocrisy, one is the hypocrisy of your, your heart, your actions, your aqidah, uh, the hypocrisy of your aqidah, and the other is the hypocrisy of your actions. The former removes one from the fold of Islam, while the latter is simply a gateway to the former. You understand that? The former, which is the hypocrisy in your heart, that removes you from the fold of Islam. The second one, which is the hypocrisy in your actions, meaning you say one thing and you do the opposite, it is minor, but it is a gateway to the former. It's a gateway to the removing you from the fold of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, Arba, there are four qualities. Whoever possesses all four of these qualities is a hypocrite. Kana nifaqan kuh. Nifaqun khalis. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever possesses all four of these qualities, he is an absolute hypocrite. And whoever possesses one or more of these qualities, then he has some traits of hypocrisy until he abandons them. Number one, and, and this is time for us to do some self-reflection. Because some of us might be guilty of some of these things. God forbid you're guilty of all of them. God forbid you are guilty of all of them. But if you have one or two that you struggle with, then inshallah ta'ala, this should be a time for you to do some self-reflection. Number one, when he's entrusted with something, he proves to be untrustworthy. Either tumina khan. Either tumina khan. That when he is entrusted with something, he proves to be untrustworthy. So, give me an example of what that looks like. Give me an example of someone who is entrusted with something and they prove to be untrustworthy. Um, when, um, when you ask someone to babysit your children. Ooh, that's deep. Go ahead, keep going. And um, they come back um, to them in like, danger or something, or something like bad happens, or something like that. Very good. That's a very deep, um, deep example. I thought you were going somewhere else with it, but no, it yeah, no, but that's, that's real talk. He said that if you entrust someone to watch your children, subhanAllah, you entrust someone to watch your children and you come back to your children, uh, in a way that you did not leave them, meaning the person maybe abused your child or abused your children while you were gone. Right? There was an incident here in Delaware of a couple of years ago where a, kid, a baby you know, at a daycare was smothered to death a few years ago, smothered to death in Newark, Delaware. I mean, man, subhanAllah, this, the baby was only what, like six months, five months, something like that. Right. You, you're a mother. You're a mother. You, you give birth to your child. The child's father, for whatever reason, maybe not around, whatever's happening, whatever. You have to go to work. It's hard enough to take the child off the breast because by that time they're still breastfeeding. Hard enough to take the child off the breast and then leave the child with complete strangers. That's what you're doing. And I want mothers to think about this because there are some women who work because they want to and there are some women who work because they have to. All women are not the same. All working women are not the same. We are not on the same level. Those of you who drop your load, drop your baby, and then you pull your child off of the breast milk, you might pump, but then you might use a substitute, and then you drop your child off at daycare, complete stranger. He's a complete stranger that you are leaving in the, your, your two, three, four, five month old child, you're leaving them at the mercy, you're leaving your child at the mercy of these complete strangers. You have no guarantees other than the fact that they are afraid that if there is some mismanagement that they might get sued or shut down. That's the only guarantee that you have. Or if there's some negligence, they might go to jail. That's the only guarantee that you have. That's the number one thing that is standing in between these caretakers abusing your child or neglecting your child and doing right by your child. Is the fear of getting shut down, the fear of, you know, uh, of being reported or the fear of going to jail for some negligence. It is rare that they are doing it because of their love of children. Evidenced by the fact that most of them working there are working there for a paycheck. Your child represents a paycheck. They don't care nothing about your kid. 
They care about their paycheck. <laughs> Understand? And the person who oversees that makes sure that those workers do what they're supposed to do because they care about their business. Here again, the concern is not the child in most instances. Subhanallah ladeem, man. I put a post out uh, a, a few months ago. I, I mentioned on the post, you know, to stop giving your children tap water. I don't know if you guys remember that. I put a post out. And I had, of course, when you put something out on social media, you got a million and one, everybody becomes a scholar. All the scholars come to the comment section. What's wrong with tap water? I was raised on tap water. I don't see nothing wrong with tap water. Blah, 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 to the end. Mind you, this is just, you know, me giving some advice. Now, if you don't feel that that advice is applicable to you, then carry on and drink your tap water. You know, catch cancer, catch, you know, whatever diseases you're going to catch, right? I had found what prompted me to do that is that we usually send my, my, my four-year-old, he's about to be four, we usually send him to daycare with, uh, with his own jug of water. We, we don't drink tap water. Haven't drunk tap water in as long as I can remember. Only thing we use tap water for is shower and to wash clothes. That's it. We don't drink it. We don't cook with it. We don't do nothing with it. And my wife found out that one of the daycare workers, he had ran out of water from his jug and she was giving him tap water. I, we hit the ceiling. You understand me? My goodness, man. On fire. When I tell you I was livid, my wife livid. Went all the way up to the top. If that ever happens again, please don't ever give my child no tap water, man. He run out of water. You send an email, whatever the case may be. I'm in the area. I work close. I will stop. I will leave on my break and I will bring you a jug of water. 50 jugs of water if I have to. Don't you ever give my child no, no tap water. Are you serious? But this is the thinking. They're not thinking because they drink tap water. They don't, they don't operate with those standards. It wasn't filtered tap water. And we don't drink that either. It wasn't filtered tap water. Straight from the faucet. SubhanAllah, man. Went to go pick him up and we noticed that his jug, you know, checking his, you know, his snacks and stuff like that in his cubby. And his jug of water is empty. And my wife's like, well, how long has the jug? Oh, it's been a few days. Okay, so what, what have you been giving him to drink? Oh, we were giving him tap water. What? My goodness, man. Hit the roof, man. My goodness, man. You know, so if you, you have your child in daycare, man, follow up. Make sure you stay on top of your child and the things. that Because sometimes these caretakers, they mean well. I'm not taking anything away from them. But you operate as a parent with a certain standard. I don't, I don't give my children Kool-Aid. So if other kids are having Kool-Aid pouches and packets, don't give my child one because he's asking for one. That's not, I didn't approve of that. Don't, don't give my child anything that I did not leave or specify for you to give to my child. I don't care what he asked for. Nonetheless, this child, two months, uh, 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 about five to six months old, this mom, you know, has to go back to work, leaves her five month or, you know, uh, six month old baby, you know, in the care of these caretakers. And one of the girls who was caring for this particular child, 18 year old girl, she put her hand over the child's mouth and covered the child's nose and smothered the baby. Smothered the baby. Can you imagine you getting a call at work saying your child is not breathing? Can you imagine you, you already, you know, you're already suffering from so many things because you got to leave your child there, you know, and then you get a phone call saying that, you know, this 18 year old child smothered your baby to death. I mean, I, I can only imagine, man, the pain, you know, that this mother went through, man, still going through. This was just a few years ago, right here in Newark, Delaware, man. SubhanAllah, man. But 
When you are entrusted with something, you prove to be untrustworthy. Yeah. That could be with money. I trust you. I loaned you money under the, you know, uh, under the guise that you are going to give me my money back. And then you don't give me my money back. I trust you with information. I tell you, hey, this is between me and you. Keep this between us. And lo and behold, I find out that you done told this person, this person, this person. Right? When you're entrusted with something, you prove to be untrustworthy. You're not trustworthy with money. You're not. Because the thing is, is that if you can't be trustworthy with small things, then you definitely can't be trusted with big things. So if a person will lie to you or do something sneaky in something small, then trust and believe they'll do that when it comes to something big. If a person will lie to you about something small, they'll lie to you about something major. Without a doubt. So if I can't trust you with something small like information, then I daggone sure ain't going to trust you with something greater than that like money or my honor or you know my life for that matter. I couldn't even trust you with some information. And this is how you test the person. You want to test the person to see whether or not they're trustworthy? Tell them something that not going to necessarily hurt you, but you want to see if that information will get back to somebody else. And when that information gets back to somebody else, then you know that that person is not trustworthy. You know where you stand with that person. You want to test your relationship. You want to test your friendship. You want to test your marriage. Give the person some information to see how far they go with it. Either Tumina Khan, four qualities of a hypocrite. Number one, when they are trusted with something, they prove to be trustworthy. Number two, when he speaks, he lies. Either Haddatha Kedip, everything come out of their mouths, he's a habitual liar. You can't believe anything that they say. If I catch you in a small lie, then better believe you've lied in something big. A person that'll lie about something small is a person that'll lie about something major. You, you lie about something minor, you'll lie about something major. That's a fact. When you speak, you lie. Yes. Does that include mixing truth with falsehood? Does that include mixing truth with I, the reason why I'm pausing is because I'm, I'm going through the Rolodex in my head because I'm thinking of situations wherein uh, a person, well, not that you would mix truth with falsehood. That's, that's a lie. All right. That's a lie. That's a person that's angling. So they mix, they put a little bit of truth with some falsehood to get to the agenda, to get to the point that they're trying to get to. That's still a person I wouldn't trust. But a person who doesn't, you know, um, omits some of the truth. Sometimes men, we're guilty of that. We might not tell you everything because in a man's mind, we're trying to spare you the hurt and the pain, even though by doing so, we're causing more hurt and pain. That's, but that's man, think, that's man logic. That's how men think. A woman is like, well, just tell me the truth. I can handle it. And then when he tells you the truth, you know, she ready to kill you. It's like, but you said, tell you the truth. You can handle it. Don't tell me what I said. I know what I said. It's just like, all right. So I know how to deal with this moving forward. Certain things I just cannot expose to you. Or I can't expose to you at this time or at that time. And unfortunately, as men, we get beat up, you know, by our wives for this because they, that's still to them considered a form of lying. It's called lying by omission, meaning you didn't tell me everything, right? Like a brother, he said that he saw a sister in the store that needed some, you know, needed some help. And he gave the sister, you know, a few dollars. True story. He gave the sister some a few dollars. She looked like, you know, she needed the money or whatever. So he saw her in the store and he gave her a few dollars. That sister later on saw his wife in the masjid and says, hey, I saw your husband at the store and he gave me a few dollars to help me out. The wife goes home to the husband and is like, you know, you know, you saw the sister in the store, but you ain't tell me you gave her money. It's like, I didn't need to tell you I gave her money. That was between me and my Lord. I saw that she looked like she needed some help, so I helped her out financially. I just gave her a few, a few dollars in my pocket. Hold on, brother. Right? And so she's like, yeah, but you ain't say nothing to me about the money. You told me you saw her in the store, but you ain't say nothing about giving her the money. 
It's like, all right, well, what do you want me to say? She told, yeah, but I feel like I can't trust you. It's like, so you want me to come forward with every single thing? And I, and I told the brother, I said, you know, it probably would have been wise for you because women don't like to be caught off guard like that. So it probably would have been wise for you to say, you know, and I, you know, I, I, she needed a few dollars and I, I helped her out with a few dollars and, and kind of left it at that. You know, so in the event that she does run into your wife or your wife does run into her and that conversation happens, your wife knows that, you know, you were as forthright as you could possibly be in that moment. But leaving out that little bit of detail, even though you did it for your own wisdom, you know, whatever your reasoning was. Now, it especially if you're dealing with a woman who is insecure, a woman who is already dealing with some insecurities, a woman who has all who you have already lied to previously. And she's trying to recover from some of the lying and the shaming and the gaming that you've done before. Then, yeah, you probably want to be upfront about everything, you know. But if you have never done anything, you know, to, you know, to make her believe that, you know, you would do anything behind her back, then, of course, that would be from her own insecurity. That would be from her own insecurity. Brother, let me let me finish this first and then I'll come back to you, inshallah. All right. So he said when he uh, when he's entrusted with something, he proves to be untrustworthy. When he speaks, he lies. And number three, when he promises, he breaks his promise. So let me tell you how you avoid promises. Don't make them. <laughs> can we go here? Can we do here? Do this? Inshallah. My favorite words to my children is, we'll see. That always leaves me that little gap. That when it doesn't go the way that they planned it, it's like, daddy, you said we could do X, Y, Z. I said, we will see. Did I not say that? We will see. Right, because you always leave a little bit of wiggle room that things may not go according to plan. And they usually never do. They usually never do. They say, we used to say before we were Muslim, you know, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. Right? Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who controls what happens, whether you reach your destination or you don't, whether you arrive at, you know, your destination or you don't. That is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the hands of God completely. You can plan all day long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala see it, you know. <laughs> my wife said, my kids say, uh, oh, when he says, we'll see, it means no. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean no. It just means that there's a little bit of wiggle room, that there's some things that may take place that may interfere in us getting to that. So don't make promises, especially not to children. Especially not to children. Children, they take those things very seriously. They don't understand that things happen, things come up, things that they don't understand that. Their minds are not mature enough to process, you know, the mishaps of life. They don't understand that. They just know you said that we were going here today or we were going here tomorrow. And they have anxiety. You ever tell a child we're going somewhere on Friday, we're going somewhere on the weekend? They keep asking you, are we still going? He's like, if you ask me one more time, we're not going. Right. They start having anxiety, man. And I'm, I'm guilty of that a lot because I try to overcompensate for my lack of, you know, being present sometime. If I'm traveling, I'm not there, whatever. I'm like, all right, we're going to Target to go buy some toys. You know, we're going to make a Target run or we're going to five below on Thursday. It's like after I get home from work, I get home from work and I'm exhausted. Like, I right, Abby, we still going to five below. Right. We still. I'm just like, oh. you know, my wife is looking at me like. Well, you shouldn't have told them. That's on you, you know, and you got to come through. You got to come through because they don't understand. I'm tired. They don't understand. You know, I said we was going at this time, but traffic, things came up, you know, something happened. They don't understand that. So don't make promises. And lastly, uh, uh, when he argues, he becomes belligerent. What does that mean? One of the characteristics of a hypocrite is when they argue, they become belligerent. What does that mean to be belligerent? Huh? Hostile. 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 Aggressive. Aggressive. Volatile. Disrespectful. Right. That is a quality of a hypocrite. That we have a disagreement and you start calling me out my name. You start using profanity. You start raising your voice. You start getting aggressive. That is a quality of a hypocrite. Why? Because a Muslim... 
is someone who other Muslims are free from their tongue and their hands. I should never have to worry about you as a Muslim. I should never have to worry about you putting your hands on me. And I should never have to worry about you talking about me or you know, talking at me to a point where I feel threatened. I should never have to fear that from a Muslim. And being a Muslim is the lowest level that you can be in our religion. That's the lowest, that's a bare minimum that you can offer as a believer. Is that another Muslim should never be afraid of your hands or should never be afraid, you know, of your tongue. So these are the four qualities of a hypocrite. Whoever possess all four of these qualities is an absolute hypocrite. Whoever possesses one or more of these qualities, then they have traits of hypocrisy until they abandon them. So if you have one of these traits or more of these traits that you are struggling with now, then this should be an incentive for you to work diligently to get rid of this. Because it is associated with hypocrisy. You don't want to be associated with that. And with this being the case, many of the Sahaba, like Umar bin al-Khattab anhu, were afraid of being a hypocrite and not knowing. The Prophet wasallam he disclosed, he disclosed who the hypocrites were in Medina to one of the companions by the name of Hudayfa ibn Yaman. The Prophet wasallam knew who each and every hypocrite in Medina was. He knew who, he knew who they were because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it to him. Because hypocrisy of the heart is a matter that you would not be able to pinpoint because it's a matter of the heart. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals it to him, then he knows exactly who the hypocrites were. And he knew. And the Prophet wasallam disclosed to Hudayfa ibn Yaman who every single hypocrite in Medina was. And the reason why he did that, so in the event of his demise, the Sahaba would be aware of who they were and leverage this information to take the necessary precautions in order to guard themselves against them. Many of the companions were aware of this secret disclosure, including Umar anhu. And after the death of the Prophet wasallam, Umar went to, you know, he was always introspective about his behavior. He went to Hudayfa. And he asked, he demanded to know that if the Prophet ﷺ mentioned him amongst the hypocrites. This is Umar, afraid like that, am I from amongst them? So he goes to Hudayfa after the Prophet ﷺ dies. And he says to Hudayfa, I ask you by Allah. This is how you, get, you demand somebody to tell you something. This is a little secret. You say, I'm asking you by Allah. You are forcing the person to respond to you in a truthful way. I'm asking you, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did Allah, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mention me amongst the hypocrites? And Hudayfa, you know, replied, no, he didn't mention you. And demanded that Umar never make such an intrusive request of him again. You know, he broke his oath. Because when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam disclosed this to him, he disclosed this in secret. And the Prophet didn't give him permission to disclose this. But he saw how distraught Umar was and how bothered Umar was he wanted to alleviate that pain, you know, that stress. You worried about, are you a hypocrite? I mean, subhanAllah, I mean, just think of one of us fearing that, dang, I might be a hypocrite, man. And there are times that as a Muslim, you should feel like that. There are times when, you know, our faith is not as strong as it could be. Or there's times when, you know, we fall into, shaitan gets the best of us and we fall into behaviors that we can't even look ourselves in the mirror as a result of. And in that moment, you should feel like a hypocrite. If you don't, something is absolutely wrong with you. You looking at yourself and you're like, man, how did you do that? How did you do that, man? How did you allow yourself to fall into that? You know better than that. Anybody have those conversations, those type of conversations with yourself? Absolutely. Umar bin al-Khattab who used to have this conversation with himself. Umar, one day he was walking and one of the Sahaba heard him. And he was talking to himself. And he says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, bakhin, bakhin. He said, you're the leader of the believers. You're yeah, right. He said, Ya bin al-Khattab, you're either going to fear Allah, or son of Khattab, you're either going to fear Allah, or Allah's going to punish you. Plain and simple. This is me when I'm talking to myself. You know, I'm like, man, what are you doing? Man? What are you doing? What are you doing? This is that private conversation that you're having with yourself, man. You need to fear Allah, Akhi. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are you doing, man? You know better than this. How you let yourself... How did you do this, man? How do you let this happen? Beating yourself up, as you should. Because if you do that, then you don't have to worry about somebody else doing it. 
If you are hard on yourself, you don't have to worry about somebody else being hard on you. Because we don't like when we get defensive when people get hard on us. Like, why are you coming for me? Why are you coming for me? Because you're becoming defensive and overprotective of yourself. But if you did that for yourself, if you did that to yourself, you wouldn't have to worry about somebody else coming down on you. You wouldn't have to worry about somebody else leaning into you because you do that. You do a good job of that on your own. As one of the scholars said, there's nothing that you can criticize me about except that I've already beat you to it. Meaning I've already criticized myself about it before you thought about criticizing me about it. Anything that you find fault in me, I've already beat myself up about it before you, before you made the critique of me. And that's how we should be. It's called a nafs al You know, you, you, you're, you're the soul that finds fault with yourself. Got to be hard on yourself. And then you don't have to worry about somebody else being hard on you. Is it time? Yeah. There we go. Yep. So we'll stop here, inshallah, ta'ala. And uh, we'll continue tomorrow, with, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the ways that we can protect ourselves against hypocrisy. We'll, we'll, we'll get, you know, um, we'll get solution-oriented tomorrow, inshallah, ta'ala. And then hopefully tomorrow, after we go through that, we'll go to, we'll go to some of the more... Uh, the good, the, the the better hearts, and that is a qalbu salih, the righteous heart, the healthy heart. All right. So that's the next heart coming up. So I know that we've been on a streak, going in on some of these, you know, difficult hearts. But it gets lighter. It gets lighter, inshallah, as we move along. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa sallam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت تواب الرحيم Oh Allah, accept from us indeed You are a tawab al-rahim Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Go back your fire Here These copies These copies you were talking about I'm familiar And you know Everyone has to go to Yamikiyama, you know. So, 